Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting from Tel Aviv, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict, and we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. This is the fourth program in a series of four about the United Nations. Today, we will talk about UNRWA, the UN Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian Refugees, and examine the issue of Palestinian refugees themselves, since this is one of the no-go points in the peace process for Israel. If you would like to obtain a written copy of the entire four-part series about the United Nations in Israel, please go to maozisrael.org slash UN for your free copy. We will also send you monthly articles that I have written in the Maoz Israel Report. On the program today, UN High Commissioner of Refugees. Who is a Palestinian refugee? Who donates money for Palestinian refugees? And who doesn't? And later, our panel of guests will share their Israeli perspective on the subject. In 1950, a United Nations humanitarian organization was established to help refugees from World War II. This UN High Commissioner of Refugees, known as UNHCR, was expected to finish its work within three years. Now going on seven decades, it is currently working in 126 countries with a staff of 8,600 and currently helping 43 million refugees and displaced persons. Its yearly budget has risen to $5.3 billion. The UNHCR has helped over 60 million people either return to their original country or integrate into their current location or resettle in another country. It has done a phenomenal job with some of the most distressed and afflicted persons on the globe. However, there is another UN humanitarian aid organization besides the UNHCR. It is called UNRWA, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees. It was established to be a temporary organization to give relief work to the Palestinians and prepare them for the time when international assistance would no longer be available. That was 65 years ago. UNRWA is the UN humanitarian organization that cares for only one group of people, the Palestinians. Today, it bankrolls nearly 5 million Arabs, has 30,000 employees, many of them from the Hamas organization, and its budget is around $1 billion a year. There are huge differences between these two UN refugee organizations. According to US law, a refugee by definition is an individual who is personally displaced or is a spouse or an underage dependent of such an individual. The UNHCR, which works around the globe, basically adheres to this definition. However, with UNRWA, the Humanitarian Organization for Palestinians alone, there's no such definition. Today we have children to the fifth generation of original Arab refugees who are still considered refugees. That is, great, great grandchildren of refugees. More than 95% of today's UNRWA refugees were not even alive when Israel was born in 1948, were never personally displaced by Israel's creation, and are only designated as refugees because to the Palestinians, this status is a birthright. 
If the Palestinians were treated like all other refugees in the world, there would be only a few thousand original refugees left in the world. And one of the main barriers to peace between Israel and the Palestinians would be absolutely gone. Furthermore, according to the worldwide UNHCR organization, when a refugee receives citizenship in another country, he is no longer considered a refugee, period. Not so with the Palestinians, 40% of whose parents several generations back received Jordanian citizenship. In fact, even if a Palestinian descendant of a refugee receives citizenship in, say, America or Sweden, he is still considered by UNRWA a refugee. Amazingly, the U.S., whose taxpayers donate over $300 million a year to the Palestinians, defend this definition. The European Union contributes another half a billion dollars. It is clear that the West is simply so afraid of a violent uprising if the Palestinians were to lose their monthly birthright benefits that taking them off the dole is not an option. Actually, those who call themselves Palestinians have never had their own state. Before Israel was birthed, the land was under the control of the Ottoman Empire for 400 years, and then the British Empire for 31 years. Lastly, Jordan invaded the West Bank and occupied it for 19 years. Should the Holy Land be given back to Britain, to the Ottoman Empire? As I pointed out, more than three quarters of the yearly billion dollars given to UNRWA come from democratic nations. As far as the Arabs are concerned, Saudi Arabia, which attends UN conferences in gold-plated Boeing 747s, chips in with $12 million. Turkey, $8 million. And another oil-rich country, Qatar, which together with Iran are the greatest funders of terror in the world, give exactly zero to their Palestinian brothers. It is only in speeches that they show their affection. But just as important, we need to know how UNRWA spends its money. UNRWA reports that half of its money is spent on education. One of UNRWA's core values is educating Palestinian children in their UNRWA schools to believe that one day, through war, they will destroy Israel and take back their land. You don't believe it? Check out a YouTube documentary, Camp Jihad by David Bedian. The Palestinian teachers there will gladly tell you how important it is to educate their young that taking back their stolen homeland from Israel is their primary goal in life. The teachers paid by UNRWA literally teach and make the children memorize the names of every village that they claim their grandparents and great-grandparents came from, telling the children that these villages in Israel belong to them. Understand that when you see a sign that says, Free Palestine, it means destroy Israel. Here's reality. Because UNRWA feeds and cares for the Palestinians in Gaza, the Hamas terrorist organization has much more time and money to concentrate on building terror tunnels and rockets and missiles to attack Israel. But it gets worse. UNRWA thwarts any attempt to help absorb refugees. In 2010, the outgoing UNRWA director, Andrew Whitley, dared to suggest 
that since the refugees would most likely not be able to conquer Israel, it would be good if UNRWA would concentrate on resettling the refugees rather than perpetuate their refugee status. Mr. Whitley backed down when confronted with an outpouring of rage and criticism from UNRWA's 30,000 employees, the Palestinian Authority, and of course, Hamas and many Arab states. I think if I had sufficient boldness, I would have called this episode God versus UNRWA. If you ask why I would give it this name, just listen to this passage of scripture in the book of Psalms. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. How could God make it clearer than this? That the Holy Land was given as an inheritance to the Jewish people. But don't think for a moment that God doesn't love the Palestinian people, all the Arab people. He created them and he loves them. He gave the Arabs a massive chunk of earth's land. Much of it is still available for development to create a good life for its inhabitants. In fact, the Arab people have 650 times more land than the Jewish people. And that's not even counting all the oil wealth. But the point here is that God gave the land of Canaan to Israel. And even if the whole world comes against the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as the prophets foretold, Israel will inherit her land because God promised it. We'll be back shortly to discuss these issues with our Israeli panel of guests. One of the ways Maoz reaches out to Israelis is by supporting the Hebrew-speaking, spirit-filled congregation Tiferet Yeshua in the heart of Tel Aviv. It is a place of intimate worship, corporate prayer, and powerful teaching for believers. But non-believers at the services always marvel at the love they receive from the people of God. Just as Yeshua said, through this love, they will know we are His disciples. Join us in reaching Tel Aviv and all of Israel. A good book can make a real difference in a believer's life. The goal of Maoz Hebrew Books Division is to bring great faith books to Israeli readers in their language. We translate, edit, typeset, and print these books in Hebrew, and then make them available in congregations across Israel. We will now turn to our panel for a discussion of the Israeli perspective on Palestinian refugees. Today in the studio with us are Director of Operations for TBN Israel, Mati Shoshani from Jerusalem, and Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem, and Israel Pachter, pastor of Beit Halel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod, Israel. Welcome and thank you for being here. It's great Thanks being here. We have some more questions that I don't know if we'll solve the problems of the world, but let's, uh, let's start. We'll give it a try. In any peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians, the latter demands Israel allow all the so-called refugees and their children and their children's children and children's children children to return to the land of Israel proper. That means Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, 
Haifa, all across Israel, the state of Israel. What would Israel look like, Mati, if those millions of refugees were allowed in as full right citizens of Israel? Well, that would obviously be a big problem for the state of Israel because you would have what is now today close to 5 million people uh, returning as citizens to the state of Israel. It would basically overnight eliminate the Jewish majority in the land, be a huge demographic problem. But that's not really the true problem. The true problem is that these people are not refugees. Uh, they are not refugees according to the UN's treaty on mm -hmm. refugees mm -hmm. because a refugee is not something that can be transferred down generations. When you are a refugee, the country that absorbs you or receives you has to. And when I say has to, I mean a lot of the things the UN says are very fluid and, mm -hmm. and uh, not strong. This is very clear. You have to grant them rights. So for three generations, these people have not been granted rights as a result of a decision made by the Arab League back in yeah. the 50s. So these people are not refugees. They are citizens of Lebanon, mm -hmm. Syria, Jordan, Egypt to a smaller extent, yeah. who deserve to be granted rights as citizens of those countries. And voila, there so is no problem. What is the main reason that all of these years the Arabs have been so completely unrelenting in saying that they want these called Palestinian uh, refugees back in the land of Israel. What is the, what's the bottom line? What's different about them and all the other peoples of the world who were refugees and now are... Well, this is what settled. Mati alluded to, which is that when Israel became a nation, the Arab majority uh, was very unhappy about it, and so they, the Arab League passed a resolution forbidding any of the Arab nations that were part of the Arab the League. The Arab majority of the UN? No, the no, Arab, Arab League. League. The, Arab, the League, Arab League, okay. They passed a resolution forbidding mm -hmm. anyone who was a member of the Arab League to absorb any of the Palestinian mm -hmm. refugees because mm -hmm. they wanted it to be an endless problem. They basically Why? Why did they want because that? Because they didn't want Israel to be there. If you if you watch the footage of when the UN is passing a resolution for Israel to become a nation, you have Arabs walking out because they were so upset about it. They they didn't accept it. They didn't accept the partition mm -hmm. and they didn't accept the land that was allotted to them. So they wanted the situation to continue. The, the situation of refugees, the pressure, the endless pressure mm -hmm. to allow these people to, quote, return or um, basically kind of like a wedge in the door. Like, they right. don't see Israel as a permanent status. They see it as a temporary status, and therefore yeah. it's completely legitimate for them to use a whole people group, per se, as pawns. Right. This so is the, yeah, let me just add, this isn't just international pressure on Israel. These people, for generations, have been told that they will return to Israel. Yes. Not only that, there is a UN-funded organization, UNRWA, which you spoke about, which is funded by international money, including the US, including the UN, yes. and many other countries, mm -hmm. which is tasked today with ensuring these people remain indefinitely Absolutely. as refugees. So it's, it's just... It's, Even it's, if they have citizenship in a different country. Yes. Even yes. if they're in America, right. like full yes. American right. citizens. Even if they're right. in France. Israel. I want to add, yeah, from the political to spiritual. Yes. Uh, now, you see, Israel is a free country. Uh, it's not Islamic country, of course. And Jewish people, they're not Islamic people. Uh, and now think about that. Jewish people came back to the land that used to belong to Islam. And even buying lands and uh, purchasing yes. lands, doesn't matter. They just uh, uh, placed right in the middle of Islamic world. And this has created a huge problem. This is why many different militant groups and radical Islamist groups will fight it forever. Right. Okay. But there is a, something in the um, Islamic religion that says that once... Muslims have possessed a certain area that forever is Muslim land, right? It's Am called, I correct? It's called Dar, Dar el-Islam. Exactly. Yes, okay. Exactly. So all of the Middle East was under the Ottoman Turkish uh, Empire, which was Muslim. Islamic. And that includes where also in Europe were the Muslims? In southern Spain. In southern Spain. Greece. So they look upon that, yes, as their land. But here, uh, as many, as many uh, Arab leaders have said, Israel is a finger in our throat. In other words, Israel is smack in the middle. And here it used to be Muslim land under the Ottoman Empire, and now it's not. And I think that that is one of the, 
reasons that, that this driving force, okay? Now, if you have a autocratic government, let's say, Saudi Arabia or Qatar, you could bring in millions of people and not give them citizenship or not give them rights, right? Which they have. Right, yes. they have. But what's the problem here in Israel? Why can't we bring in the five million Arabs and just live happily ever after? Well, because we would have to grant them rights. We'd that's, have to grant them rights. That's almost constitutional What in our kind country. of rights would we have the to grant them? to vote, and then they would vote out the to Jewish vote. state, and you'd have an Islamic state. Exactly. So even people who think, well, Israel deserves, uh, Israel must bring in these five million because it's democratic, it wouldn't be democratic very long, probably past one more election, and it would be I think one law. thing people just, because people always look at like today, 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 everything's so intense. Just look at history. There were seasons in history where there was movement across the globe. So forget Israel and Palestine or whatever. The After World War II was a huge, and really the whole early 19th, uh, 20th century was a time where a lot of people were moving a lot of places. You had tons of Jews that were being displaced out of all over the world, and you had Arabs that are being displaced. The, I mean, you had Japanese, you just had like so many people that mm -hmm. were just moving. And so if people would just say, okay, this was a time of movement, there was suffering, there was trials, and we relocate and we grow from there. I mean, the Jews have been kicked out of, out of the land before historically, and they just adapted to where they were sent, and they blossomed there. And God even said in scripture, you know, when Daniel goes to Babylon, he's like, just blossom here, you know, mm -hmm. just grow right. and, and whatever. Right. And, and instead of they just decide that they're just going to yeah. perpetuate Let me just this. add some numbers to what you said. Post-World War II, we're talking about 35 million people who were displaced from their homes, out of which today there are just the Palestinian people, and, and of which alive today are about 30,000 people. Those are those who are alive who were displaced in 1948. They're the only ones out of 35 million people mm -hmm. who are still considered displaced today. Let me add something else that we didn't talk about is that the last time the Palestinians were refugees was not when Israel expelled them. The, in, from Kuwait, yeah. 1992, this is post uh, the Gulf War, 1991, yeah. yes. 300,000 yes. Palestinians were correct. expelled from the country without any rights. They were thrown out of their businesses, their homes, and expelled. Most of them ended up in Jordan and still have no citizenship. And it just happened two years ago, too. In Syria, you have hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees who fled that country into Jordan again. Yeah. So this is an ongoing problem that right. is being enforced by Yes. The Look, I Army. have a friend who is, for all intents and purposes, a Palestinian refugee. But really, his family moved to this area in the early, 19, in the early uh, 1900s because they had to flee Syria. So, so they were kind of like Syrian refugees that moved to here. Yeah. And, then, right. and, and each right. time, you know, they just right. remained well, displaced. Israel... When we start really talking about the Palestinian people, we have to always remember there's never been a Palestinian state. There's never been a Palestinian people. The PLO succeeded in rewriting history, and they started, they invented the Palestinian people. Now, I know that a lot of people will say that is a fanatical statement. It just happens to be the truth, okay? so. I want to say huh. something about that. Yeah. Uh, I think that Arafat didn't so much rewrite history as much as he rewrote the emotions that went with history. Because people, you know, again, if you just look at, at the numbers and, you know, whatever, then you can say, okay, these people are displaced, these people are displaced. But the Palestinians went from a people that were displaced and had, a, a, you know, trouble to, like, the suffering entity that exists because the Jews live here. It, he, he just rewrote the emotion, and this is what people remember today. People yeah. don't remember facts. They just remember okay. Palestinians, poor people. All right. Israel. The whole world believes, basically, there was a Palestinian people. How can you say that's not true? Besides just saying, well, that's not true. The first of all, uh, it's history. Everybody can uh, approach the history and study or just check simple facts of history. I remember being in Jaffa. I heard once a verbal uh, fight against a local Islamic man and Jewish uh, visitor of his store. So I asked this Islamic person, just wanted to encourage him. I thought the Jewish guy gave him a hard time. And I said, why, why, what, is what, about, what, what, what was it about? And, and uh, 
Arab guy from Jaffa, he told me, this Jewish said that it was Palestinian state. And he said, I'm living here, my father lived here, my grandfather here. There was no Palestine and no Palestinians. I had, my parents had a Turkish passport, then British passport, now Israeli passport. So it's very simple. It's one of the personal stories I just encountered here in Jaffa. Uh, so Bible for Christians is the main source. If you read the Bible, if you check the prophecies, then check the history, it's very simple. So it's always it's taken us back uh, if we, know to, if we want to know the truth, yes. the inspiration is the Bible yes. and the history. And we're speaking about 50 years, 60 years of history. So it's not difficult to find it. Right. So in closing, I just want to say all of us here in this panel, we love the Arab people. We are as happy to see Arabs come to their Messiah, come to the Lord, come to faith as we are our Jewish people. Yes. And so Indeed. that's it for today. Thank you for watching. And we hope we were able to give you an insight which will help you pray for Israel and for your nation in a more focused way. For more articles about Israel, sign up to the free Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. If you would like to obtain a written copy of the entire four-part series about the United Nations and Israel, please go to maozisrael.org slash UN for your free copy. We will also send you monthly articles that I have written in the Maoz Israel Report for free. Don't forget to join us next week for another program of Israel Frontline. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv. The Maoz Israel Report app brings the free monthly Maoz Israel Report publication right to your fingertips. All the reports in all available languages, videos and bonus photos, all in one place, on your tablet or smartphone. Download the free app today and get the insider's perspective of the way things really are in Israel.